Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well and you've got uh, a beverage ready to go. Um, I'm going to jump straight in. So today we'll be going over the challenges that schools are facing with their networks and security solutions in today's BYOD and computer-centric learning environments and how to overcome these with the Fortinet Product Stack and SASCAN's online student safety platform. I'll do a quick introduction to K-12 landscape before we hand over to Brendan to start going through what are the key challenges. So schools hold valuable digital assets and the safeguarding of students, staff and school community stakeholders requires an increased investment of money, time and it also provides learning opportunities. And in the USA, the education sector has recently surpassed healthcare and government as the industry that suffers the most ransomware attacks. And mistakes by the education staff and third party vendors and the lack of digital literacy and cybersecurity awareness are unfortunately creating points of access for cyber criminals and hackers. As you can see in the slide, there are some scary statistics such as a 29% increase in the average attacks per organization per week um, in 2021. And there was a 17% increase in the number of cybersecurity breaches for Australian, the Australian education sector, with that education sector now in the top three most attacked sectors in Australia. Some attacks are so successful that in this one instance, uh, it disrupted the ability for New South Wales teachers to prepare for online classes just days out of the return of school. Um, and with the New South Wales Education Department taking its internal systems offline as a precautionary after an incident was discovered. So this is proof that these attacks are actually causing disruption. The threat environment in a school is a complex one. Um, there are more obvious external threats, such as your traditional malware and restricted content, but there are many internal threats as well. Uh, one of those is, you know, students need uh, measures in place to ensure they can't get access to staff areas of, and networks, um, because those areas and networks are where personal data could be stored. Uh, and then as soon as you put Wi-Fi into the equation for a school, the threat surface is extended significantly and it's extended outside of the school building and outside of school times because they're now not having to just rely on um, physical infrastructure in a classroom. And this perhaps paints a more threatening picture on the slide than what more, uh, most schools will experience. But as we see processing power, uh, the increase of BYOD and the increase of students' confidence with technologies, uh, it's important to consider what is the worst case scenario? And today's perimeter for schools is no longer quite easy to define. Now, traditionally, the data center was once the network's primary point of entry and exit, but now with this explosion of new connected devices, with 5G, with BYOD and hyperscale cloud deployments, uh, these have all extended that perimeter across the entire infrastructure for the school. And the proliferation of applications and the number of connected devices are again creating many, many more edges that have to be managed and they have to be protected. And you have to be prepared and understand what these edges are in order to protect fully. And a scary statistic is according to Google, more than 80% of traffic is now also encrypted. And this is presenting a new challenge for inspection of malicious traffic. And a recent report by MAA, which was performed by uh, RMIT University and also Wollongong University, it highlighted that half of the 50 most used education apps across the 148 schools that were involved in the study are using platform apps that fall outside of a dedicated education suite. And these apps enable for things such as uh, advertising data collection. Another really big highlighted issue is that games make up 15 of the top 50 apps uh, for which these are less likely to protect a child's um, privacy and uh, they don't have the education focused services and apps, um, SLAs uh, and reporting functionality. 
And with that, I'd like to hand over to, to Brendan to talk about what the key challenges are. Over to you, Brendan. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm just gonna jump ahead. Okay, so there's a few key challenges that I've experienced in, in the K-12 um, space. And, you know, I've been working in K-12 for many years. So these are things that I've discovered and really worked on to try and solve. Um, so the key, the first one is authentication. So it's a matter of how do you get user information to marry up to the logs to then analyze what the students and staff are actually doing in your environment. And these challenges extend from just your normal wired PCs that are domain joined and all the way out to wireless BYOD devices. It could be, and it goes further than that because it could also be IoT. So it could be Chromecasts or um, you know Apple TVs. It, it could be any form of device on your network. There's also the pastoral care problems in schools whereby you know we've got cyberbullying and self-harm and things that we want to protect students from and protect them from themselves um, and not only that it's a matter of being aware of these issues and then you can have meaningful discussions with the students to help them along their journey and really protect them um, and then there's visibility so you know none of this is possible if you can't analyze the logs and analyze the traffic and marry it up to a user information. And, you know, these logs will be your go-to for anything that this, that happens in your environment. And then of course, you know, once you've got visibility and you've got the user information in, well, now you've got to apply security to it. So that's your web filtering. Your DNS filtering and then you can also see the applications they're using like F Facebook or LinkedIn or Google or DuckDuckGo you know or any any form of application on the internet as well and uh, with this security as well it also goes further than just the internet we're also now doing internal segmentation of your network and analyzing the traffic that's traversing between your student networks and your staff networks to your servers or your um, internal resources and we're filtering that traffic as well. BYOD devices have always been a challenge. They are difficult to monitor and contain and so it's more about just the authentication and getting that user information off the device and what the device is and then applying policies to it that's you know appropriate for those devices. Schools are also required to retain this information as well so that uh, you know if an incident does happen or you know something that is critical of nature those logs can be analyzed at a later date and then you can come back to it and figure out a way to better protect your staff and students you know as opposed to actually having an incident. So the first one is authentication. So the solution that Fortinet have, it's really starting to piece together many pieces of the puzzle. So you've got the Forti client, which is the endpoint protection on the machine. You've got Forti Authenticator, which basically is the identity management. It collects everything and uh, monitors the users. And then the gate for the firewall and the security purposes. So with the 40 client installed on every machine on your network, it provides transparent and seamless authentication for your assets. And all these events that happen on the machine is then sent to the 40 authenticator. And then the 40 authenticator can then go and look up your Active Directory or look up um, you know, your LDAP servers with whatever form you're using. And then once that user information is then received, it gets it then gets passed into the security fabric. And then all your 40 gates in your network receives it and those users are then monitored and logged. By having the 40 client on the machine, it also allows for IP address changes or Wi-Fi roaming. It really makes that authentication piece seamless and the user has no interaction with it. It just works. 
and they could go from wireless to wired or vice versa. They go from wired to wireless. They could even change SSIDs and that authentication will still work. The Forti Authenticator will also monitor for logout events. So if the user disconnects from the network, the Forti Authenticator will make sure that that user is actually disconnected from your fabric. So the Forti Authenticator also captures events from other sources as well. So it will log into your Active Directory servers and pull the security logs. Those security logs have the user log on and log off events when they join a wired machine that doesn't have 40 client installed on it. It also does radius authentication. So if you if you have your BOID devices or devices that don't have 40 client installed on it, then when they connect to the wireless or to a wide port with security enabled, that radius that radius uh, request will then be received on the authenticator and log that user in. And it will still do those lookups for group memberships and everything else that goes along with it. So this solution is really tailor-made for, you know, a central user and device authentication. It, it's the central piece of the network and provides it to every device in your fabric, whether it's switching wireless or your gate. The 40 Authenticator also enables two-factor authentication. So you can pair it with your 40 tokens and those tokens can then be used for your VPN logins or um, you could use your 40 Authenticator to provide access to Microsoft 365, for instance, and have the authentication for that and then use a two-factor authentication. So it's that critical piece of the infrastructure. The 40 gate is the firewall that we use on the perimeter, but also on the internal network as well. So if receives all this user information from the authenticator, it receives the endpoint information from the 40 client. And then we can provide dashboards to, you know, see what the users are doing, see what the clients are doing, see the vulnerabilities that the clients have. And we can apply policies based on that as well. So we can use um, tags to show whether a device is compromised or not, and then, you know, not allow it access to the network. Uh, the user information is then matched obviously to the traffic and so you don't have to know the IP addresses of the device anymore. So they could, the IP address is actually becoming irrelevant in a lot of situations because we're matching it to the user and the device. So I've got a bit of a demo of this situation with the 40 client and the 40 gate. Um, I'll just bring it up on the screen. So right now I've got a Windows 10 machine. So if I log in to my Windows 10 machine, if I bring up my 40 client, you'll see it's managed by EMS and I've got web filter and application control applied. Um, but I also have the user information. Um, and we can enforce users to actually fill in these details as well if we like, but we don't need to um, if it's connected to Active Directory. If we have a look at 40 Authenticator, um, you can see here on my status screen, I've got one logged in user and we can also see that it is an FSSO user, but we can also see that it's a 40 client workstation. So if we look, go to the monitor, go to the SSO sessions, You'll see here when the user logged on, which I logged on earlier today, which is why it's 10.42. Uh, you can see it received an update at 11.15. So that was just when I logged into that machine. You can see the name of the machine, the IP address. Um, I could have grouping um, for that machine as well. Um, and then you've also got the username. The source is, it, you can see it came from 40 client, but then more importantly, you've got your group membership for Active Directory. So these groups are then what we use to apply the firewall policies. So if we look at my 40 gate, I get a little baby 40 gate. So it's a little slow to load sometimes. You'll see here, I've got four logged in users at the moment. And 
you know, you'll see that administrator is logged into a few different machines here at the moment, but you'll also see user one, which was collected by that 40 gate, uh, sorry, the 40 client and passed through to the authenticator. And you'll see that I'm a member of the main users. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically that. Um, and if we look at, I think the security dashboard, You'll then see the host is compromised as well. Well, I've got a compromised host. Um, but this information is also passed through from 40 client. Um, it may not load. That's okay. So the next part of the solution is visibility. So it, with the visibility, we've got three pieces to the puzzle. We've got the 40 gate, the 40 analyzer, and then SASIAN provides the pastoral care. The 40 gate provides a rich visibility into the applications, the websites, the traffic volume, and the content, um, and the threats that are traversing the network in real time. So these logs uh, with the user authentication um, gives us the better web filtering and application controls at the user level. So it means we could have different different year level students in different AD groups and actually have different filters. So you might have some users that are allowed to use Facebook and some that are not. Uh, so you could filter on that prov provided that you have a group set up for them. You can also provide better and accurate pastoral care information for students. So when we were talking about self harm before, we can actually pick up the keywords that are searched in Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing and pass that through to SASIAN to then be reported back to the teaching staff and you know the heads of department and you know maybe even the principal if they want to know as well. The 40 analyzer it receives all this information from the 40 client and the 40 gates. And then it analyzes and actually goes through all the logs to look for threats and look for information that we're targeting. And it has comprehensive monitoring that you can actually go in live and see what is happening on your network in real time. It also shows the performance of your machines and you know there's lots of information that we're not going to go into today, but for the analyzer has its own, like there's a whole series of information that we could talk about on Analyzer. But the key things that we're gonna look at is like, you could look at IOC, so indicators of compromise and botnet detection and control, command and control servers. Um, it also shows the top sources and destinations of your network traffic. So where, what's the most used information from your students? Like what are they consuming? Um, and it also shows the applications and websites. So, you know, are they using Netflix? Are they using YouTube? That's the sort of thing that we want to know. And then we also want to know if they're using it in class time. So we could filter on time and date. Um, and the analyzer really integrates with the security fabric and provides the automation around it as well, around this intelligence. So if we go back to my gate, um, and we look at 40 view applications. I might trim this down. Oh, there we go, it loaded. Um, you can see here I'm using PowerPoint right now, right? And uh, I'm using PowerPoint to obviously do the presentation. Um, you can see I've got Outlook open, OneDrive. I'm using Citrix services. Um, you know, we're using GoToMeeting. Uh, you know, I've got Teams open as well in the background. So all this information, so Bing, like LastPass, is then passed through to the analyzer with the user information to see who's actually using these services. Um, if I go to my analyzer, Get a log view. You can actually see all the all the logs with the information, 
and we can click into any of these and it will give us more detailed. So you can see here, this is my Xbox. Um, you know, it's detected. Um, Kieran or Colin or Rio, can you mute please? Someone's um, causing an echo. Um, if we go further in, we can go to 40 SOC and inside 40 SOC, um, this is where we've got the threat hunting, you know, and the analyzer goes through and actually looks for patterns in the logs to then, you know, automate and a function and either block the traffic or allow it or look for compromised hosts. Um, you know, there, there's so many different things that it can handle. Um, if we go to event monitoring and go to, where is it? CNC callbacks by threat. So you can see here, all these events um, is traffic that's going back to a command and control server. Now, any of these could be crypto locker that's on your network. And, you know, if you can get to the CNC server, well, then you'll get the encryption key and the data will be encrypted. So blocking these CNC requests is very important on your network. And these are all blocked on the 40 gate. But this is the kind of visibility that we can see. Um, if we go to 40 view, you know, we can go to applications and go to top applications. And to, now we can see we've got RDP open, we've got VNC, um, you know, IMAPs. Uh, we've got all these applications that we can filter on and look at what the students are doing. We can go to top browsing users and see the user activity at least. Yep. So we've got user one here and you can see they've gone to 15 sites. Not only that, they've also done 65 meg. You know, and we can see that it's a Windows 10 device. So there's lots of information at our fingertips. So for the pastoral care solution, the 40 gate, as we were just discussing, provides the logs to 40 analyzer. What happens next is the 40 analyzer then forwards these logs into SASYAN and SASYAN then does its own analysis of these logs. And for this, I'm going to pass over to Colin, who's going to discuss more about this solution with you. Over to you. Thanks so much, Brendan. And uh, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit more about SASYAN and what we do here. Um, so SASYAN is an AI powered online student safety solution specifically designed for K-12 schools. Um, we deliver on three primary value propositions, starting with flexible classroom controls, advanced alerts of cyberbullying and self-harm, and easy reporting of student online activity. To provide a little bit of insight as far as um, our infrastructure and how this works, um, we rely on four key APIs. Um, the biggest thing to note here is that Azure, which is our, our flagship product, is hosted um, on AWS and is an entirely cloud-based solution. Um, so this means that there's no appliances or agents or anything that need to be deployed, which means that there's pretty much no maintenance after the initial setup. Um, this starts with whatever identity management the school is using, whether that's an on-prem solution um, or something like Azure, uh, which allows for all of the user and group mapping and the authentication into the 48 firewall, um, followed by an API into the collaboration and productivity, um, so either Microsoft or Google, which allows for our chat and email inspection against anything from um, cyberbullying, self-harm, online grooming, threats of violence, um, things like that. And lastly, integration into um, the LMS, which allows for teachers to quickly access the solution within their tool of choice, um, being mindful that there's lots of different users that will have access to the solution. So we wanna make sure that it's accessible to non-technical eyes. Um, and most importantly, obviously, connecting with the FortiGate firewall, um, this allows for logs to be sent to us to then analyze for our alerts and reports, um, and also for any sort of firewall rule overrides to be ex executed within the Azure portal. So we'll now dive into an actual demo, starting with the dashboard. 
So when you log in, um, you're greeted with a fully customizable dashboard. Uh, as I mentioned before, being mindful that the vast majority of our users are not in a technical space. So we wanted to make sure that this was suitable for anyone within well-being uh, in the classroom, so teachers, leadership, anything of that nature. One can easily customize the widgets that are displayed here. So if you're coming from a more technical perspective and would benefit from something like application bandwidth usage, um, heavy web users, um, components like that, or um, something more heavily focused on well-being, we've got our at-risk users, uh, internet score, um, with the ability to drill down a little bit further and generate a report and do a deep dive into any information that might be alarming from that dashboard. Going back to that first value prop that I spoke of um, in regards to the flexible classroom controls, this is brought to life starting at the dashboard with the ability to quickly implement a temporary firewall rule override. So this gives the user the ability to create a rule just for their relevant users or groups. Um, that can either be an allow or block rule and apply to anything from applications, web categories, or even a specific URL. So this is a great resource to leverage if maybe you are a science teacher and want to quickly grant access to a, a YouTube video outlining the impacts of climate change that might normally be blocked. One can quickly go in, uh, grant and allow rule for an hour, uh, which would apply to just their users. And you can see that's immediately active on the FortiGate firewall. The second component of this involves the integration into the existing LMS. Um, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that the software is accessible uh, within whatever tool of choice the, the teacher has. Um, so this is an example of the Schoology integration where within that workbook, you can see here the SASE and Assure extension, which allows that teacher to create a rule right from their workbook. You'll notice the users or groups selection is missing here because that's going to apply just to that class. You also have the ability to establish a recurring rule. So let's say for the next three weeks, uh, we've got a year eight science teacher that wants their students to be able to access um, only a couple of key web categories for their period one class, which is going to be on Monday and Wednesday. So here, uh, that teacher could set the parameters. Uh, maybe they're, they're doing an assignment dealing with health and medicine, and they don't want their students to be able to access anything else on the internet. You can simply define um, that you want to block everything else, which would then require, or which would then only allow those users access to the categories, uh, URLs, or um, specific sites that have been established here. The next component of the LMS integration involves the classroom view, which gives teachers visibility to the overall activity of everyone within their class for the past 15 minutes. So here we have a, a uh, view which showcases uh, pretty good web activity. No one's accessed anything of concern. Um, in a minute, we'll go into some of the rating and refinement of the web categories provided to us from Fortinet, which would then indicate um, either yellow or red based off of the level of concern. Going back to the issuer platform, um, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of key uh, reporting components here. So this begins with the web categories provided to us from Fortinet. Um, on startup, this is immediately populated, so there's no need or even ability to set up web categories within Azure. Uh, this is relying on that API within Fortinet, which will pre-fill all of the existing web categories. But what one can do is set up the ratings for these categories. Um, so in that classroom view that we just looked at, um, that would either be green, amber, or red based off of the, the rating of that category, um, which is also used when we generate a user report um, where this rating kind of serves as a um, like user credit, online credit report. So we encourage our users in the well-being space to go through on startup and define on a scale of either poor to excellent um, how they would define each of the categories coming from Fortinet. We also have the ability to define whether or not that category is reportable or available to the rules created. So this serves as a safeguard for IT professionals to ensure that something like an adult web category would never be able to uh, be used for an allow rule in the classroom. 
The second piece is our words and phrases dictionary, um, which correlate to the classifications that are used for the actual triggers of those advanced alerts um, against cyber bullings and self-harm. So this is a full local dictionary that's provided on startup by Assure um, with the ability to import crowdsourced words that may have been added by other users to keep ahead of any emerging trends um, or language that students are using. So or words and phrases and transversely classifications are gonna refer to um, anything from the actual words and phrases used in chats, emails, social posts, and the actual search content, whereas those web categories are gonna to correlate to the websites visited, uh, videos watched, and end search results, and are used for the creation of these alerts. So this brings us to our next value prop, which is actually setting up the advanced alerts um, against cyberbullying, self-harm, online grooming, and threats of violence. Similarly to the rules function, you'll see only the relevant users or groups um, displayed here. So to make sure that one, you're not being bombarded by unnecessary information, but also to ensure confidentiality um, and that a, a teacher that has nothing to do with another class or a well-being professional that's only in charge of maybe secondary school wouldn't be able to set up an alert and have visibility to the online activity for groups outside of their duty of care. Here, one can also define individual users. So if you have a group of students to look out for, this can be specified here. Um, and again, we're selecting from our categories or classifications. So category alerts are gonna be those websites visited, um, videos watched, things of that nature. So let's say we'll do weapons and alcohol and drugs to start. And for the classification alerts, we'll start with cyberbullying, self-harm, and extreme, deception explicit. Um, here a user can define whether or not they would like to receive an immediate notification or if they're happy with just the once a day, uh, end of day alert email. So um, maybe for something like self-harm or weapons, given that that indicates a potentially urgent safety concern, you wanna go ahead and be immediately notified, whereas the others, you're just happy to receive that end of day email. With the ability to prioritize those alerts um, based off of whether or not the, they're a recurring um, alert, if it's happened once or multiple times, and also based off of uh, a student's peers. So the cohort relative prioritization can factor in if you've got a class assignment um, where you know maybe a lot of students are looking up um, drugs and alcohol or something like that. Um, if you've got 20 alerts that are triggered in the same group, that would likely be because of a class, prior, uh, a class assignment and would be assigned a lower priority. Uh, here, a user would just define the recipients of that particular alert, which is gonna be delivered to your email in the form of a nice in uh, kind of in-person briefing or memo sorted in accordance of priority. So this gives visibility to the top 10 users found within the alert, classifications, categories, um, and the high priority alerts at the top. So the first one we can see is based off of cyberbullying, where a student sent another student, uh, you have no space, you're such, or you, you have no friends, you're such a waste of space. So even just without going into the software, this email will give you visibility to the users involved in that alert, um, the platform that that occurred on, and what period that happened in. Um, here we've got a great example of the Dictionary match. So here, the student said the suicide hotline was useless, complete joke. I don't know if all this is worth the effort anymore. Um, with the actual term that triggered that underlined here. Whereas this one is leveraging our natural language processing engine, which is an AI component that takes into account the context of that alert. So even if it's not coming from that local dictionary that we talked about, um, the natural language processing is able to piece together words where on their own they might be fine but it's the, the context or the overall phrase that indicates the concern, as well as a fuzzy logic near-term analysis, which takes into account any misspellings. So let's say suicide here was, was misspelled or maybe had it in a one instead of an I, um, that would still be intelligent enough to factor that in. And then you've got your lower priority alerts down here based off of a couple of searches and websites that have been accessed. So when you uh, investigate an alert, 
that takes you to the historical overview for that particular user. Um, so here we can see the first example where the student sent uh, their peer something dealing with the suicide hotline. So we can see that bolded term, which is what triggered the alert. You also have the ability to generate the context from that. So this leverages that API into either Microsoft or Google to display the chat history on either side of that message. Here you can export that to a PDF um, if that needs to be followed up with a parent or the teacher or uh, whoever their responsible um, duty of care or pastoral care is. It takes us to our final value prop, which is the uh, overall and comprehensive reporting of student online activity, which can be done on a user level or on a group level based off of app or web activity. So these typically are based off of investigation where the alerts are based off of trigger. So let's say that from those alerts, you've identified a few students to look out for. Uh, maybe you've had a conversation with them or your well-being team have had a conversation with them in the past, and you now wanna see if their web activity has improved um, and just kind of where they stand. This report is gonna give you a high level overview um, from this first tab of their web rating. That's what we talked about based off of all the websites accessed, how their overall web rating um, is, is shown. Any videos that have been viewed, URLs that may have been blocked, and overall data consumed. With the ability to drill down further and have access to um, things like web, app, search, and video activity. So here you can see a user's entire web activity, so anything that was accessed, the action that the 40, 48 firewall took, whether that was allowed or blocked, as well as the period that that's taking place in. Um, same thing with apps, the uh, rating, so if it, how a, a user's web rating has changed over time, any searches they may have executed, or videos that have been watched with the ability to launch that video and view it for yourself. And lastly, any alerts that they may have triggered. So as I mentioned, uh, this is really after the, um, the alerts have come through when you're wanting to perform an investigation, um, either based off of user level um, or groups. So if we've got, if we want to identify um, any student that may have accessed a particularly concerning video, um, maybe we've identified a, a video that's been distributed and you want to have a conversation with any student that's watched or distributed that, you could generate a report for any student that's accessed uh, a video or a website or even done a specific search. You also have the ability to generate an offline user report, which will provide visibility for anyone that has not been detected on the network um, and shown in a, a nice graph here. What do you do yesterday? You might not have any data for the last couple of days, but essentially the offline user report would showcase anyone that has not been detected on the network. Um, so maybe they're using a VPN or hotspot or something like that. So hopefully that provides some insight into the um, flexible classroom controls, advanced alerts, and comprehensive reports. Um, and if anyone has questions, feel free to pop those in the chat and I will um, follow up with those individually. But back to you, Brendan. Thank you, Colin. That was um, really well done. Um, so, the next topic that I'm going to discuss is security. Um, just making sure people can see my screen. Okay. So the security fabric uh, includes multiple pieces to this puzzle. And so in this instance, it's the 40 gate, the 40 client, the 40 analyzer and the authenticator all communicating together to provide overall security for your entire network. So the 40 gate replaces the perimeter firewall, internal segmentation firewalls and security appliances with one single next generation firewall. So this device can be placed in the center of your network. So, you know, it replaces the core switch and so all the routing functions are now done on this device instead of the core switch. So switching just becomes switching again. Um, it consolidates multiple security appliances into a single unit with powerful threat protection and throughput performance. So Fortinet have their ASIC chips, which 
really improves the performance of the gates, which is why we can now consolidate your network into these devices. The traffic traversing the 40 gate allows for visibility and security. So if we start having the traffic flow internally and externally through your 40 gate, then this is more information that we can provide to staff and, you know, and obviously the SASCAN and other platforms to then really get that comprehensive picture about what's going on. Um, and it provides comprehensive security in a wide product range. So, you know, we can provide units for little networks or we can go right up to enterprise data center grade units as well. The 40 client is the endpoint protection that provides advanced threat protection against exploits, ransomware, and advanced malware. And it's powered by 40 Guard along with 40 Sandbox integration. So 40 Guard provides the web filtering content. So you know it matches the URLs to categories, but it also provides the AV signatures and IPS signatures that protect the device from attacks, basically. Um, the 40 Sandbox also allows for files to be executed in a safe environment that monitors for malicious behavior and then blocks access to that file if it is determined malicious, even if it doesn't have a signature. This, the unipo unified endpoint features include compliance, protection and secure access in one singular modular lightweight client. So we don't need to have multiple agents installed to do many things. So the 40 client has vulnerability detection. So you can look at all the applications installed and see whether it's vulnerable to current attacks, as well as providing web filtering when the user is offsite and antivirus and um, VPN connectivity as well. The endpoint quarantine helps to quickly disconnect a compromised endpoint from the network and stop it from infecting other assets. So if the analyzer detects malicious traffic, it can actually tell the 40 client EMS server to quarantine that asset and stop it from tra transmitting data and information to either outside resources that are trying to get that information or stop the virus from actually attacking other machines in the network. So it can, it can also prevent the lateral movement. The 40 analyzer allows you to automate workflows and trigger actions. Uh, with connectors and playbooks and event handlers to accelerate the response to these criti critical alerts. So, sorry, I was about to sneeze. <laughs> so where we looked at before and we could see the CNC callback events that are happening on my um, on my 40 analyzer, we can use these, we can use the workflow and triggers to actually quarantine that device from the network so it it's protected. And we can respond in real time to these events and which are network security attacks or vulnerabilities or potential compromises. We can orchestrate the threat intelligence, event correlation, monitoring alerts and reporting for immediate tactical response and remediation. So it, it's really that piece that ties it all together and tells your fabric what to do and how to do it and really protect the network in real time. The 40 Authenticator is used to capture that user information, log them onto the network, provide multi-factor authentication. It collects like the security logs from multiple sources to make sure that all these users are known about. And if a user tries to authenticate that doesn't exist, well then it's not going to be allowed on. Um, it informs the every device in the fabric about these users. So then they can be allowed to do something or blocked to do something. It also ensures that the users are, when they disconnect from the network, they're also logged off. So no traffic can pass as that user and, you know, and no one can be impersonating that user. Um, so if we look at the traffic logs, I'm just going to, have a quick look at the screenshot. So 
So we can see here in my logs, I've got user information with an IP address. Um, there's obviously a bug in my um, in, in this version that I'm running. I'm running 721, which is the latest. So yeah, I don't recommend it at the moment. Um, but you see the destination, the application, whether it's allowed or blocked, and also the policy that it's hitting. Um, so this information is then passed on to the analyzer to then do something with. Um, and I've got the wrong browser window open, so forgive me for a second. Um, if we look at 40 client EMS, so EMS is a server that controls all your endpoints. And with this endpoint, we can, or with this server, we can set up our antivirus. And, you know, we can provide, um, you know, malware protection. We can do real-time scans. So as files actually land on your device, it gets scanned. Um, we can also do your typical scheduled scans, you know, like once a week or once a month. It also does anti-ransomware. So it, it looks for common places that ransomware attacks your files and then prevents it from making changes to it. It also does anti-exploit. So it can see whether Chrome or Firefox has adware or spyware installed and can prevent that from accessing your network and really like get into the details about what's going on on that machine. Uh, we can also do web filtering. So if, and this web filtering profile can also be pulled in from the gate, so it's synchronized. So whether the device is at home or remote, the web filtering is the same experience for the end user. And we've got the same categories. So we've got adult mature content. We've also got the security risk category. As you can see, I'm actually allowing everything at the moment, but we could block it or we, or we could allow it or warn. Now, the difference between monitor and allow is we need to have everything set to monitor so that it can generate a log. If it is set to allow, any traffic that is allowed does not generate a log. So for the visibility aspect, we want to monitor everything or block it. Um, and that's the best way to get all that logging information. Um, we can then do the vulnerabilities. So if we look at this device, um, we can see there's three vulnerabilities. And you can see here that, you know, I've got Steam installed and it's it's currently vulnerable to a CVE. Um, also the GeForce experience. So uh, it, it looks at all the applications that are installed and it doesn't have to be Fortinet related. So you can see here, even VMware tools is exploited. Um, and all this information is then correlated to the gate and the analyzer to then really give you that overall look at your network and look at the attack surface and see where you could be compromised. It can also be used for triggers. So you can automate the flow. So if we look at the 40 analyzer again, sorry, I've got to log back in. Um, if we go back into the 40 SOC where we were before, we've got the automation. So we've got playbooks. So if we create a new playbook, we've got all these different things that are already provided and all you've got to do is just set them up. Um, so we could, you know, compromised host. If, if the host is compromised, well then we can get it to create an incident so that someone like, so that there's a record of it and run a report. And that report can be emailed out to, you know, your IT personnel or, you know, the heads of department. Um, but it can also quarantine devices. So, you know, we've got quarantine devices by 40 OS or EMS. If we quarantine it by EMS, well then that's going to quarantine it using 40 client on that device. If we quarantine it by 40 OS, it's going to tell the switching or the access points to stop that device communicating on the network. So these playbooks, really give you the power to automate your response so that it happens in real time and not 10 hours later after you've received a report. BYOD. So BYOD is always a challenge. And in this environment, we're limited in terms of what we can install on BYOD devices because they're controlled by the user. They're not controlled by an organization. So with the 40 Authenticator, 
we basically do what we do radius authentication with the wired or the wireless devices depending on what how they're connected to the network and that radius authentication is captured by the authenticator and then we can do LDAP lookup back into AD for instance and collect the user groups check the password uh, you know any number of things to make sure that that user is authenticated correctly to the network once they're authenticated, it that information obviously gets passed straight through to the 40 gate like we discussed before. We can also attach different radius attributes. So we can do dynamic VLANs. So that if you have a BYD device versus a corporate device, then the corporate device might go into you know a trusted VLAN that has deep inspection enabled for the SASIAN reporting. But then the BYOD devices might go into a separate VLAN and only get internet access. They may not get access to the inside of your network. Um, there's different ways that we can protect your network from with BYOD devices as long as the policies and the attributes are set correctly on the authenticator. Once again, with the radius accounting, the when the users are logged off from the wireless or, or disconnected from the wired network, the 40 authenticator then logs them off the network as well. So no one can impersonate that user. The 40 gate receives this information and then obviously triggers the network to respond um, based on the information it receives. So, you know, if it's a VLAN tag, it'll tell the switches and the APs to put that device into that network. Um, if it receives a log off request, it will then obviously tell them to log off. Uh, you know, the traffic is then filtered by that BYD user group that it received from AD, or it might even be a device group. So if you want to trigger Apple devices can access Apple TVs, well then you could have a policy just to do that. Or you could have an Android policy and allow Androids out to the internet. It's really a choice of uh, how you want to control your network. So log retention and compliance. So this is the, and like, this can be a difficult thing for schools because they've got so many different platforms and the logs are being moved around in so many different places that they're losing the log retention. So the 40 analyzer is obviously provided by 40Net to capture and be that central logging point for all the students and staff information, right? And a lot of people will turn around and say, oh, but I've got cloud logging or I've got, um, you know, like, some people misunderstand that SASIAN, for instance, is doing the retention of the logs, but if you disconnect that service, you're gonna lose access to those logs. So the 40 analyzer, you know, we use on-prem to store those logs and you can retain them for seven years or 10 years, however long you wanna store them for. Um, but it's really, you know, it's really used for that history to see what's happened in the past and also compliance. So we can run reports on the logs that it receives to make sure that you're, you know, if, if you have to hit PCI compliance because you've got sensitive information on your servers, well, you can run a report for PCI compliance. And, you know, there's 180 pre-built templates in the analyzer that you can run reports on. But the good thing about the analyzer is it also supports syslog. So you can have, you know, third party devices also sending its logs to 40 analyzer and then so even if you move on from the 40 gate and you get a different device you can still send your logs to the analyzer and they're still in their own container um, and kept for whatever your retention period is um, so if we go back into the report so where's my analyzer gone this one. Um, if we go to reports, I, you can see there's a whole bunch of different folders. Um, you know, like we can look at asset and user reports and we can view the user detail browsing log. So we can put in the username and see what that user has done. We can see the top five websites by bandwidth. So we can see, you know, you've got a thousand students using YouTube. There's going to be a lot of bandwidth there. Um, we can see 40 client reports to see the vulnerabilities. Um, these are just some, you know, compliance reports. You've got your PCI, you've got wireless PCI, um, you know, 40 gate reports. You've got asset and identities. You've got DNS reports. 
yeah, and the list goes on. There's 180 of these, right? <laughs> there's, there's a lot. Um, but on top of that, you can also do custom reports as well. So you can create your own templates or and pre, use pre-built macros, or you can create your own charts and macros and data sets. You can even get into the SQL if you want and write your own SQL to feed into these reports. So it is really powerful and these reports can be scheduled to run every day or every month or you know it's on a timeline of when you want to do it and when you want to see this information uh so now we've got some questions uh or question and answer time so q a um yeah we've had a uh, a really good question come through uh from Tani. He was asking for students chat, is the detection limited to the timeline when they are connected to the school networks or can uh, alerts be sent on keywords when the students are connected to external networks and or the internet externally? So I'm assuming so, that was a question for Sassian or? That would be a, a, a question for Sassian, yeah. Yep. Um, so because there's a specific API into whichever um, collaboration or productivity that you're using, that's 24-7. So regardless of whether that's on the network or off the network, um, that's going to do anything. So all of your chat, email, and drive inspection. Um, so we're recently or we're um, very soon rolling out our safe image I for OneDrive um, and full support within Google Drive, which also looks for any sort of evidence um, of, of nudity or inappropriate images. So any of those integrations would be 24 seven, regardless of whether or not that's on the network. Thanks, Colin. I've got another one here uh, from Matthew, who's saying for Sassian to get full visibility, for example, keywords, does it require SSL deep inspection to be deployed? Yes, it does. So without that, you would just see in the report under either web or app view, uh, there'd be a pretty large component of just um, yeah, I would just say SSL. So if you're wanting to view the individual search terms or searches and videos watched, that would require um, deep packet inspection, but only for the categories that you want. So if you want to just do something like search engines or streaming media or whatever that looks like, um, you can do that on a category basis to ensure that personal information is still protected for something like financial institutions or um, something like that. Thanks, Colin. Um, Brendan, let's so, just look through and see if we've got another one. Yes, so we've got one here, Brendan. This is um, on the Fortinet side. Um, Tanim's asked, how is the risk level determined for applications? How is, how is the risk level determined for applications? So um, I assume you're talking about the, well, sorry, there's two different types of applications. Is that so I believe what he's referring to is when we were going through and looking at the applications that are transversing the network on the logs, it was showing a risk level for each of the applications. Ah, okay. So that risk level is determined by the FortiGuard service. So, you know, for example, um, you know, like Bet365 would have a higher risk because it's to do with gambling and, um, you know, associated activities, which is obviously um, something that is addictive. So that so those risk levels are determined based on the type of site it is, the type of application, and the forty guard engineers are the ones that determine that. Um, so if you want more information, we'd have to go and find more information from forty guard about it. Perfect. Um, there's a couple more questions. If anyone's asked any questions, we uh, we will get back to you um, post this event just to answer any outstanding questions. Um, Brendan, um, because we're a little bit over time, let's just quickly power through the um, the last couple of slides I, here. I was just going to answer one question from Tanin yep. again, which is if these solutions are installed in, in the BYOD devices, can the user force close these apps? Um, there is actually a 40 client that you can install on iPads and Android devices. And 
if they are managed, they need to be managed by an MDM. So once they're managed by an MDM, they can't um, they can't force close it because it's done at a system level, not at a client level. Um, so that that is something that we've successfully deployed elsewhere. Um, anyway, do you want to present on the next slide, Kieran? Yep. So just a quick one about um, where to go from here. Um, there's a couple of things that, that you can do. Fortinet has a uh, Cyber Threat Assessment Program, or CTAP, which is a free selling tool um, that can help you, fundamentally help you create an assessment on uh, what kind of traffic is traversing school network, what the threats are. Um, if you want more details around this, this CTAP program, you reach out to us, you can reach out to Fortinet. Um, we're all happy to, to help you. you know, it is a, a, a free tool that, that Fortinet runs. Um, there's also a lot of information in the Fortinet Partner Portal. So if you go to partnerportal.fortinet.com and under Assets, Fortinet has a whole um, section dedicated to uh, education in there and there's a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of marketing material as well um, that is quite useful. So jump in, have a look through there. Um, if you found some information, you have some questions about it, feel free to reach out to us here at Wavelink. Uh, or you could just, if you want to get a little bit more details about what we've gone through today, um, please feel free to reach out to us, whether it's the sales team, your account manager, or directly to the pre-sales team. Um, everyone's more than happy to quickly step through and to re-go through what we've presented on here. Other than that, that's it for, for today's webinar. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks again for coming along.